Get your Bibles out. We're going to get ready this morning to dive into our last installment of our God series, our God messages. It's really our our opportunity at the beginning of the year. Uh, We wait till after 21 days of prayer and fasting, but we have a chance then to bring you um, you, what you were able to do, we were able to do through your generosity in the previous year. And we did that in week one of this series uh, to just show you a small picture of all the things you're doing here and around the world. And then last week, we looked at opportunity. We looked at the opportunity that you and I have this coming year. And many of the things stay the same, just the activity of the church. And thank you guys for being a part of that. It does not happen without you. Uh, We talked about some missions things, missions projects, and some uh, activities, outreaches local, and then serving here at the church. And so uh, we want to just, again, always be uh, mindful and thankful for all that you do. Uh, Today, we're looking at the last segment because I believe generosity plus opportunity equals destiny. It defines who we are who we are as a church, who we are as a people. And, and in some regard, it's, it's the same for uh, uh, all churches, if you will, and there's things that are unique to individual congregations. And so we are just trying to be who God's called us to be. And if you come from another church or you have experiences elsewhere, uh, we're just trying to be the tree of life God's called us to be, amen? And so we don't compare or be in comparison, but if we'll all do our part, he gets it all covered, amen? It's the same within the body. If you just do your part, why he brought you here, with your unique gift and ability, we have it all covered to be able to minister to the people here and around the world. And so we're going to take a look at destiny today. And to get started, I want to start in uh, Genesis. Uh, We're going to start in Genesis 2, but Genesis 1 is all about the story of creation. And I love it. I read it it quite a bit, actually, because I just, uh, things come alive to me in that. And then we're going to jump in starting in chapter 2, verse 1 this morning. So let me read Genesis 2, 1 through 3 as we get started. Here we go. Here we go. It says this, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. And so on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And on the eighth day, God created the NFL and he set the Kansas City Chiefs and gave them authority over all other teams. And he told them to take dominion over them and be fruitful and multiply Super Bowl championships. And he looked at what he created and said, it is good. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Hey. You didn't think I was going to miss an opportunity, all right, to celebrate. You didn't think that at all. And uh, all joking aside, I just wanted to take a moment and say, yay, go Chiefs. And uh, (laughs) I also want to say, you know, we had just a fun thing that the coffee shop created. They want me to say this. They created some specialty drinks representing the teams. And not only did the Chiefs win on the field, they won in the coffee shop uh, last week, 14 to 3. And... uh, For all you Cowboy fans, a little bit of something to celebrate. Even the Cowboys beat the Eagles in the coffee shop last week, so there you go. All right, so erase that. That's not part of my message, y'all, and uh, I just wanted to have some fun this morning. Uh, Let's jump down to verse 15, and let me read this uh, for you as we get going. And we're talking about, well, let me read it, and I'll explain it. So the Lord God took man, took the man, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And do you realize the intentionality here and what God was doing? He had a place for man. And I want to say that today. We're talking about destiny. Destiny is a place. That it has a place for you to be. It has a place for you to grow. It has a place for you to develop. And reading the creation story, it's amazing God's intentionality as he's setting things in place and on this day and that day and speaking to this and speaking into that. And all of a sudden, here he creates someone in his image. He created man in his image and he put them, an image bearer of God in a particular place and gave him instruction to take care of it. And I want to talk about that from the standpoint of destiny today. Destiny is a place. I was, I'm reminded of it uh, from just yesterday, uh, we had a memorial service here. And uh, we had a dear brother of ours that had been in Tree of Life for almost 40 years, uh, 39, 40 years. Um, Joe Van Zant went on to be with the Lord after uh, a long battle. In fact, the reality is it was a miracle that he had, was on the planet as long as he was. I can remember several years ago, then it was like he was, he was, leave, he was going home any moment. And then a couple years later and a couple years on and on. And so miraculously, God extended his life. But I thought about Joe Van Zant, as I sat there and I, I saw the family, many of them I hadn't seen in a long time. 
Uh, I know them all very well. Uh, I saw the daughters, and one of them was just three years younger than me, so we were in the youth group together. I remember Joe uh, had at his house when I was a teenager, the church started when I was 13. I remember 14, 15, uh, Joe had and his wife hosted uh, youth group events at their house. They had a pool, and we would go over there. Also, in their pool uh, early on in the history of Tree of Life, water baptism would take place. When it was time to baptize people, uh, my dad, the founding pastor, would invite all the people getting baptized They opened up their home, and and for that afternoon, people would get water baptized in their pool. I thought about all the years that he was here over the 40-year span and serving in different capacities, and he was a greeter and had a huge smile and a contagious laugh and and just a big bear hug. He he just was so kind, and I I can remember uh, walking out to the main lobby after services, and it didn't matter if I felt within me I did a good job or a bad job. He always said, you did a great job, and I always appreciated that encouragement, and I can remember building projects in many years, over 41 years, we've had a lot of building projects. He was out there working and working hard. He was a life group leader. He led a group of RCA uh, airplane, remote control airplanes, and uh, just wanted to lead and do anything he can. I thought, that is a man who is fulfilling his destiny. And I thought about that for a minute, how God sets us in a place and it's not a place that we just come and go and we easily leave. And I'm not, it's not a, me trying to like make everybody stay here. The first year, you're going to try and get, this is me uh, encouraging you to find the place God has for you and then put your roots down because your destiny is fulfilled in those moments. And so it, it was this idea of, there were this picture of Joe just giving us life in his time and using everything he is and has for the, the purposes of God with the people that he, that he put in this place. And, and it, it just landed so hard on me yesterday. Uh, and certainly the, the sadness in my heart for his departure, but, but the honor of knowing him and being a part of his life because Joe imparted things in my life. I mean, to be honest with you, as a teenager and many youth events and stuff, he was speaking to my life. And even up until uh, the last time he was here to be in service a few weeks ago, I was just a big hug and a big encouragement. And that is what our destiny offers each and every one of us, to be in a place where we can grow and help others. The power of place. A few weeks ago, Jess and I were in Austin and we were in a meeting and a gentleman was there to speak and uh, he talked about the power of place. And as I was listening to him, things just began to roll around inside of me. And I knew that I was supposed to bring some of that out today. And then as I sat yesterday in that service and hearing so many people stand up and talk about Joe's life and how he impacted him, I wanna tell you today that destiny is a place and God has a place for everyone, a place for people. And basically that means Find your place, find your people, find your purpose. Put down your roots and flourish, as the word says. We don't run around, we don't bounce around, we don't hop around. I, I know there's a, a, a searching to find that place. I, I get that, and that's a spiritual decision. There's not one place that's gonna check all your boxes. There's just not, God would not put you in a place that checks all your boxes because he wants to grow you. Come on, somebody. He wants to stretch you a little bit. And so he's gonna ask you to be stretched wherever he, wherever he lands you. And so, But there's a place for you. And now in Genesis, we see, in this passage we just read, that the very first gift God gives humankind, the very first gift God gives humankind is a place. It's a place to belong. It's a place to work and tend and to grow and to flourish. It's a place he sets people in. God gives the gift a place. And so God gives us a place, a gift, a place, a destiny We see that in Adam and Eve's life. He made them in his image. He put them in that place. He said, be fruitful and multiply in that place. Make this place flourish. You have everything you need in this place. And as if almost to say, have a blast, enjoy this place and go and take care of it. The first gift God gives to humankind, he gives the gift of place. And now when you follow the story and you go on to chapter three, Adam and Eve take the place in their own hands and do their own thing, right? We know the story. Uh, You can only eat from this. uh, Don't eat from this tree. You can eat from any other tree. The enemy comes in to deceive. What is he trying to do? He's trying to get Eve not to focus on her place, on her destiny. Brings in a little bit of confusion. There's a better place for you. There's another place for you. This isn't the place you think it is or not the place it could be, even though God set them there. And so she, he gets caught up in all that. And the result of them participating in that a sin, if you will, is they, it results in their fall. We know as the fall, they allow sin to come in and the curse comes in and they're removed from that place. They're exiled from that place. 
And here's where they experienced the first curse. So the first gift God gave to mankind is a place. The first curse mankind's experiences is placelessness. In my mind, there was a better amen in that moment right there. But <laughs> the first gift God gives to humankind is a place. And the first curse, the enemy wants to get you into placelessness. And as that is not profound, I don't know what is. God has a place. He has a destiny for us. And he tries to get us out of that place. And he tries to get us into placelessness. Every one of us needs to embrace the gift of place. And so this gift of place, I want to talk about that because I believe it's wrapped in destiny. Let me give you three things that it does for us. Place gives us, number one, security. Security. It's a place of security. In other words, it's a place where you feel safe. You should feel safe in that place. In fact, what's, what this lands on me is I, uh, we have, as you know, and just a few days ago or last week, our grandson turned six months. I cannot believe it's been that quick already. And I find the thing that we do and, and the things that we find ourselves is just a lot of hugging and loving. And you know what we're really doing? We're really letting him know that you're safe and you're okay and we got you. And I remember my kids were little and they're growing up. The thing we all tried to do with our kids before we laid them down to sleep is say a bread time story maybe, pray over them. What are we doing? We want them to feel safe so they sleep all night. <laughs> 12 hours, you know. <laughs> We're, what we're doing, everything we do, we feed them and we clothe them. And what are we doing? We're trying to create security so they feel in a safe place. They feel safe in that place. And that's what this place is. It's a place where we hope and believe that you can come in and feel safe and feel secure. You can come in here on a Sunday morning and take a deep breath and say, it's okay. There's security here. I can be who I am here. God loves me just the way I am. There's people here who love me just the way I am. Oh, we all have issues, but this is a safe place. God has a place called destiny, and in that place is safety and security. And that's what we all want and long for, and God knows it, so he creates that in that place. He creates it to be a gift in that place is a gift of security. It's for all of us. The gift of place gives us security. Then it moves on from there, and it gives us a sense of identity, a sense of identity. That place, that destiny God sets us in, and, and that garden environment was a place of security. I mean, God was there. They walked and talked with God in, in the cool of the day, and it gives them an identity. They knew in that moment that they were sons and daughters of God, and, and there's an identity that comes that you find in the place, and I'm telling you, if there ever was a time to be rooted in a place like this for identity, it's today. I'm appalled at everything I read about identity this and identity that and changing all this and all that. And I'm not here to, to say, say that message today, but I'm telling you, in the house of God, you should learn your identity in God. It's a place where you know who you are in Christ. You know that you're a son and daughter of God. You don't find that out in the world. You don't have anybody out there telling you that, but in here, you're gonna hear it over and over again. It's a place where you come and learn your identity as a son and daughter of God. It's a place that we, it's a place that you know who you are before, you're told who you are before you even know who you are. I, I, remember, I remember growing up and a teenager in church and, and people call, calling me and, uh, not calling me, but praying and blessing me and saying stuff. I didn't even know what a prophet to the nations was or whatever, you know. I don't even know some of these terms, but I knew I was one because everybody was speaking that into my life. So can you imagine our kids and our teens and we're calling things that be not as though they are. Come on, somebody over your kids. And we're saying, you're a mighty man of God. You're a world changer. You're a champion. You're going to change the world and not be changed by the world. Why? We're giving them an identity greater than themselves, an identity as a son and daughter of God. Before they even know what that is, they're being told who they are according to the word of God. Amen? Now you find that. You don't find that anywhere else but the house of God, this place, identity. And I stand here today because on my journey, there were men and women in this church through the 41 years that spoke the things of God over me, prayed for me before I even knew what those things were even at times. They called things that be not as though they were. And when I fell, they were there to pick me up and tell me who I was, not what the world was saying. This is a place of security. You can take a deep breath here. And this is a place of identity. You can learn who you are in Christ. 
And this is a place that gives us mastery. And mastery, interesting word. And what I mean by that, by mastery, is that you can sharpen your skills. You can grow your gifts, your crafts. Super Bowl last week. A lot of things I loved about it, not just the outcome, but I love the stories leading up. And I read a lot about the two quarterbacks, right? Patrick Mahomes and Jalen Hurts. I loved what they were saying about their families and about their dads. And But do you know this, that Patrick Mahomes' father was a professional baseball player? Jalen Hurts' dad was a high school football coach. Do you know that they grew up in a place of going to locker rooms, practice, sharpening their skills? That was just how you live. You just worked hard. You competed. And then I got the thing, and a lot of Super Bowl stuff had Peyton and Eli Manning on there. And uh, I love the Mannings because their uh, nephew signed with the horns. But anyways, that's another story. And uh, but can you imagine Peyton and Eli Manning and now Archie Manning going along? Can you imagine their dad, Archie Manning, spent 13 years in the NFL? Can you imagine as kids, they, they grew up thinking every kid studied playbooks. <laughs> they grew up thinking that every kid watched film. They grew up thinking every kid got up and, and ran and worked out. and pra- they grew up. Can, I, can I tell you, this is a place where our kids will learn mastery. They'll learn how to pray. They'll learn how to believe God. They'll learn how to exercise their faith. They'll learn how to read the word of God. And you know, some of us need to master some of those things too. But you're not going to do it out there. Don't think you can do it on your own. There's too many distractions. But this is a place where you come and and you master the authority that you have through Jesus Christ. This is a place where you learn to walk in that. It's a place where you learn to speak to things. This is a place when you learn to lay hands on the sick. It's a place where you learn to cast out devils. Not because you're a, a, a minister of the gospel, but because you're a believer. I go to church because I'm a Christian, not because I'm a pastor. I pray for people because I'm a Christian, not because I'm a pastor. And you learn how to pray. You learn how to believe God. You learn how to trust God. You learn how to worship. Don't just come and and sing songs. Learn how to worship. Enter in as you're being led. Enter in. You learn how to praise and celebrate the things of God. This is a place of security. We can come and take a deep breath. This is a place of identity where you can learn who you are in Christ. And this is a place of mastery where you can learn to walk in the things that God has given you and do what he's created you to do. And the church is where you learn how to be a strong follower of Jesus Christ. The gift of place, your destiny, is wrapped in security, identity, and mastery. And I believe that this is for, that, for people, that this is that place for people. I want, you to, I want to take a moment and uh, in light line of what we're going to be talking about in just a minute. I meant to do this earlier, but I just talking about destiny and reaching out around us. I want to talk about the area that God's called us to. He didn't call us to a city. He put us at a place where we can reach the surrounding area. In fact, I just, many of you aren't, aren't from New Braunfels. How many of you are not from New Braunfels? Raise your hand. That's probably over 50%. Maybe all the New Braunfels people come second service. No, I'm just kidding. And... Uh, <laughs> But it's important for us to find out where you live because we believe our destiny is to have a place in other places and places where you live. And so I want to take a quick survey this morning. If you got your phones, get it out. <laughs> no, who am I kidding? You already have them out. What am I, what am I talking about? Right? <laughs> uh, get your phone out if you got it. If you want to, you don't have to. If you're online with us, you can do the same thing. And you can text. You'll see the information on the screen. Text TREE, the word T-R-E-E, to that number right there. And what you'll get, you'll, it'll pop up. It'll give you uh, something that you can see and it'll have some selections or choices that identifies where you live. It won't come up on the screen. We'll ask for it in a little bit, and we'll get a, uh, an update showing where everybody lives. I think we'll all be fascinated by the information. This will help us in walking out the destiny of this place. I want to encourage you to go ahead, get your phone out, text tree to that number, and you can do that immediately, or you can do it sometime throughout the service. But it'll ask you to identify where you live, and that'll help us be that place, not just for here, but where you live a place of destiny in your area. So you can do that. But we have a destiny. I want to share this. We have a destiny to be a place of diversity. I need a bigger amen for that one. We have a destiny to be a place of diversity in Jesus' name. Amen. And when you walk into this place, you see diversity. In fact, I dare say, I don't say this proudly. I say it humbly and feeling the responsibility of it. But we're probably the most diverse church in this area. You'd have to get into San Antonio or Austin to find a more diverse. And I don't say that proudly, but here's what I know. God is doing something with diversity in this church. Diversity is our destiny. If diversity is not your destiny, then this might not be the place for you. And I don't mean that ugly. 
God has a place for everybody and everybody has a place. But here's what I want to say is we are, will be a place of uh, diversity that is part of our destiny. And I'm so thankful for all of you that come from different backgrounds and colors and and incomes and, and ethnicities and however you want to say that. Here's what I believe. We're all part of the human race, so I'm not going to say races, right? We're all one race, uh, but we have different backgrounds and ethnicities, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a, our destiny is and always has been to be a place of diversity, And so I believe that's what God has called us to. And let me just say this, not every community is diverse. So that's no judgment on anybody. And we know there's communities that have uh, a bit more uh, of a people group than another. I I get that. But God, because of where put, I want to say selected, we're situated, there we go, (laughs) positioned regionally that we draw from all around the surrounding area. And that helps us be diverse because I believe that's part of our destiny. I want to say this to you as well in light of what we have just experienced the other night. We had the night to shine. I believe that we have a destiny to be a place with people that have a special need. I I believe that. I can't describe that to you. I felt that burden for years if you've been around here. We talk about it every time we do these messages. We pray about it and we're obedient in God's timing as we have opportunity, as we have resource and manpower. And I believe that there is more that God is leading us into to minister to families that have a loved one with a special need. I believe God's calling us to extend our sensory room. We have one sensory room in the elementary wing, but there's older kids that come, teenagers, and when the kids that are in elementary graduate up to the next level, we need to create a sensory room for those kids as they get older, older kids coming. So if they get overwhelmed by the people and the crowd, the noise, that they can find a place to kind of calm down and be reintegrated back into the class. We're not looking for isolation, but reintegration. And so there's things like you've heard me talk about over the years about an all-inclusive playground. I've not asked for money for that. I've just pitched that out there for prayer. We've been praying, and we have just seen money come in without even asking for it. We have a a, a good amount of money in the bank (laughs) designated for that. But an all-inclusive playground is not cheap. But that's okay, because I serve Jehovah Jireh. (laughs) I serve a generous God, amen, and above and beyond God. And at one point in time, when we're doing our research and we're doing everything, we're not going to jump into something significant like that uh, without prayer and study and research and resource. So we're very patient with that. We thank you for your patience. But God is moving and working, and we'll let you know more about that. We believe our destiny is to be a place that families that have a loved one that has a special need can come and feel secure, find their identity, and find mastery. Amen? People of Diversity can come no matter what color, what socioeconomic background, what age. They can come and find security, identity, and mastery. Uh, Pastor Eric and I, uh, maybe two weeks ago now, met with Mayor Brockman, uh, the mayor of New Braunfels. And this is his last term. He finishes in May. And and then we'll meet the new mayor. And we had an opportunity to sit down and ask him about this area, New Braunfels. Where is the highest crime? Where is the greatest poverty? And we already kind of knew the answer to that because Tree of Life sits in District 1 in New Braunfels. And District 1 is the district that has the highest poverty and the highest crime rate. So I think, thank you, God, for putting us where the greatest need is. Amen? And so we're already right there. So therefore, our destiny has to be to address poverty and crime. And so we're doing that through feeding programs. We're already doing that. You saw that for the the outreach here. But we're going to be more intentional. We're going to find those particular areas that we can do prayer walking, right? We can walk on site with insight, and we can pray for those areas. We're looking at beautification projects in those areas. We're going to continue to be a blessing with resource there. And that who God has called us to be, our destiny is to be in the area in this community that has the greatest poverty and the greatest crime. And I think we can change the atmosphere around this area. Amen? Amen. I believe that. Uh, The surrounding area, I believe we're a regional church. I believe we're on where we sit on I-35, not just because because we're not just, as you already raised your hands and we talked about, we're not just a New Braunfels church. We love New Braunfels. We sit in here, but we're also a regional area church, if you will. And so we want to have a presence and be a blessing. I've shared this before too, and everything's timing in the kingdom, talking about praying and seeing what God would have us do in the areas that you live in. And I don't know if we're ready, if we're ready already by now, if you've had a chance to do any of that texting, but Jesse, if they've had a chance, if you could put, maybe you could put the results up at this point in time up on the screen, kind of the 
areas where people are living at there as we do that. You can see the majority of our first service people that have responded are in New Braunfels. And, and you can see, let me get my card out so I can tell you what the areas are. So uh, the first one, of course, is New Braunfels. The second one is the San Marcos, Cal, Buda, Buda, Austin area, or north. West is the third uh, chart that you see there, or column that you see there. It is Canyon Lake, Bulverde Spring Branch. Uh, the fourth one is east, so Seguin, McQueeny, Marion. And then the south is Cibolo, Shirts, Converse, San Antonio, and then online activity. So I believe as this service continues, if you haven't responded yet, then please do that. It really is good information for us. And then we'll add second service to that. And next week or the week after, we can give you the results. But I believe it speaks to our destiny and we are to be around this area. And so God's put some things in our heart to reach out to the areas that you live in where we have concentration of tree of lifers and see how we can be a blessing in your community. And we're going to be asking you in the upcoming weeks about interest meetings. Uh, if you live in the particular one of those areas, how you can come and then you can be a part of what we want to do in that area because we can't just do it on our own on the staff or anything like that. We got to have people and you're always so generous with your resource and with your time. And so I want to thank you in advance for that as you pray and see what God would have you do as this being part of your destiny. Amen? Amen. All right. So I want to move on now and um, turn to Romans 16 for me. I want to finish up with this passage of Scripture. Place of destiny. Destiny is a place. And, and in this passage of Scripture, this is the last book in the, in a, the last chapter, rather, in the book of Romans. And Paul wrote the book of Romans, and Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and Paul was and this amazing scholar and uh, just highly educated and well-respected. And after he came to the Lord and he started like, uh, you know, writing the New Testament and all those things out, uh, what you find in the book of Romans is perhaps one of the strongest books he has written theologically. Um, it's the richest, perhaps, of all the books that he wrote in the New Testament, and it ends, interestingly enough, with this passage right here, uh, chapter 16. And it's interesting that Paul would end perhaps his strongest, and if I could say it this way, maybe his greatest writing book, Romans theologically, to the church in Rome, he ends like this. Let me go ahead and read this for you, Romans 16, 1 through 16. And he says this, I commend you, our sister Phoebe, she was a deacon in the church. Uh, your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> Centure. I practice it. Centure, which is in Greece. You can go on to the next one. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people. Make sure you love and honor, honor, respect her. Give her any help that she may need from you because she is a great sister. For she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. In other words, she's helped fund my ministry. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to him, Priscilla and Aquila. Paul, at one time, he was previously known as the artist Saul, and he was part of killing Christians until he saw the light. Jesus revealed himself to him. He turned to Paul, changed his name to Paul, but everybody was afraid of him, except Priscilla and Aquila. And it, what happened was Priscilla and Aquila invited Paul, formerly known as Saul, into their home and he lived with them for 18 months. And you know what they did in those 18 months? They discipled them. They discipled them. They taught him what it was to be a Christ follower. Because before that, he was killing Christians. And now they embraced him at great risk. And they discipled him for 18 months. Greet also the church that meets at their house. And they are also our home church leaders. Or can we say it this way? Small group leaders. Yeah. Greet my dear friend Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of, in province of Asia. In other words, I was preaching in Asia. And the first one to come down the aisle was Epinetus. Man, what a joy that was that day. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Nobody works hard harder than Mary. She is such a humble servant. Greet Adronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who had been in prison with me, who had been in prison with me. Junia was a woman and risked everything for the sake of the call. She didn't care what it cost her. 
She did whatever was needed to be done and even found herself in prison as well. They are outstanding among the apostles and they were in Christ before I was. In fact, I get a lot of credit for everything, but they came before me. Greet Ampliatus, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my dear friend Stachys. Greet Apelles, whose fidelity to Christ has stood the test. Nothing could shake him. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my fellow Jew. Greet those in the household of Narcissus who are, who are in the Lord. They'd love to hear that. <laughs> You'll get that on the way home. Okay, all right. That's, I won't do that second service. I, I get it. I won't do a second service. Okay, all right. <laughs> Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa. And yes, they are twin sisters. Those women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis. Another woman who's worked very hard in the Lord. And anybody that thinks women can't be in ministry, come on. Right there. Leaders in ministry. Right, right there. Paul obviously loved it. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother who has been a dear mother to me. I don't know what I would have done without his mother loving me in the church. I'm not even her kid. But my life would not be the same had she not mothered me in the church. Greet Ancytius, Ancytius. It sounds like a disease. I'm sorry. It's like my Ancytius is emptying up again. I don't know. <laughs> Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobas, Hermas, Hermas, and the other brothers and sisters with them. Greet Philogus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister and Olympus, and all the Lord's people who are with them. Amen. What's Paul doing? What an interesting passage. You know, I believe Paul was doing, he's making sure we don't forget what's most important. The people in the place. And here's Paul, the greatest apostle, has written two-thirds of the New Testament, and here's what he's doing. He's with great affection, talking about his relationships within the church. And he's saying, if it had not been for them, it wasn't just me and Jesus. If it had not been for them, the ones who discipled me for 18 months, the ones who showed me what it's like to risk it all at all costs, even if it meant imprisonment. And Paul needed to know that lesson because he walked through some stuff that all of us probably would have quit. But he learned how not to quit from people that were imprisoned with them. And what about the mob? We already talked about that. What about that first guy that came down and gave his heart to Christ? I remember that moment. What about? What about? Paul's saying, it's the people that matter. And the church is something because of all these saints. 29 names he used. 29 names he knows and trusts. 29 names that impacted his life. And this is Paul's letter to the church at Rome. This is possibly the greatest book he's ever written. And he chose to end it, talking about his affection for the people in the church and how they impacted his life and his life would not have been the same without him, without them. And understand all these people that are represented here, some are Jews, it mentions them as Jews, some are Gentiles, meaning non-Jewish, some are rich, some are poor, some in the household of Narcissus. Narcissus was an assistant to the emperor, and it means there's people in his family or in his house. Some were slaves or had been slaves. You have all walks of life represented in these 29 names. And he's like, it's the church that helped direct his destiny. I love the picture that he paints here. And I'm thinking about Joe Van Zandt. And how many people got baptized in his pool? See, if he's around then, they would have and thank Joe, because I got baptized in his pool. It all matters. People matter. And Paul's trying to make a people out of all these names. He's saying, if you want to make it in life, you need to fall in love with the people in the church. 
It's our destiny. Security, identity, mastery. We, we come together and we, we love each other and we serve each other and we do what God's asking us to do. It's, it's our, all our destiny. Paul's saying that you don't get the life of God, the kingdom of God, without the people of God. Our destiny is not to fall in love with the property, with the programs, with the prosperity, and certainly not the politics of a church, but to be a place that falls in love with the people of God, where we can create environments of security, identity, and mastery. And the trend in our world today is that people are walking away from the church. I read all that. The church in America is in decline, they say. People are walking away from the church. They're walking away from the place but we have to be a people that falls in love with the people because it's the people that keep us here. There's a destiny in the place where God's people gather. And Paul says, fall in love with the people, not the crowd. See, here's the thing. I believe he's also saying it's easy to hide in the crowd. We can be a face in the crowd. We can be comfortable in the crowd. The crowd costs us nothing. But Paul's saying your destiny is to fall in love with the people. The church is growing in places like Cuba. It's growing like wildfire. It's growing in places like Pakistan. Huge crusades, which we get to be a part of in October, where they're believing to see 100,000 people give their life to Christ. It's growing in places like India, even though the greatest persecution is happening now has happened, but the greatest growth in the church is happening at the same time. It's growing in places like Vietnam that's now opening more and more to the gospel because it cannot contain it, keep a lid on it. It's growing in Nepal. It's growing in Mexico and it's growing in Turkey and God will use this terrible tragedy to open the door in a greater measure for his goodness. And it's not because, it's not because there are programs, projects, and properties. It's because of the people. And where the people gather, they find security, identity, and mastery. They find destiny. And they know they need God and they need each other. See, we don't just gather to hear the word of the Lord. We gather to bind up the wounds of each other. We find security, identity, and mastery. That's why Group Link. Small groups is so important. You heard that. You saw Phoebe having a house meeting, people coming over to her house for a group meeting. Many of them did. We need that. And when we live as people of destiny, it doesn't just help us. It helps the city. It helps our area, and it helps the world. See, there's a ripple effect that somehow goes out from here across the world. We're not just taking care of each other when we come and find security, identity, and mastery, we're participating in the healing of the world. And that's why I want you, if you haven't already, to grab one of these cards on the seat back in front of you. You need to fill it out. Why? It's your destiny. So your name can be uh, read off a list like Paul. Here's the people that impacted my life. Who knew in that moment when they invited Paul, the Christian killer, into their home to disciple for 18 years, that he would change the world. Who knew when she would mother him like her own son because he didn't have one? What he would, the man he would eventually become. That's why all of us need to fill out this card if we haven't already. Psalm 68, five through six, let's close this out. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. Now listen to this. God sets the lonely in families and he leads out the prisoners with singing. Amen. God sets people in. In other words, God has a place for you. It's your destiny when he sets you there. He sets you there to work it and take care of it. As we saw, his gift to you is a place and that place is your destiny. When you work it and take care of it and you fall in love with the other people that are that are work it and take care of it and the people that you're bringing and you find security, identity, and mastery, it affects not just here but around the world. And here's what happens. When we walk in our destiny, God will use us to refamily the world. And that's our destiny. We are here to refamily the world. And yeah, it begins right here. But what begins here? changes the world, I believe. That's our destiny, to refamily the world. And if he's put you here, that's your destiny too. We're here to be a tree of life to a lost and hurting world, connecting all people 
to the life, love, and power of Jesus, creating environments of security, identity, and mastery. So find your place and you find your destiny. And let's go forth together and refamily this lost and hurting world because God is a good and faithful God. Amen. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. My heart, my hope in this series, and especially today, is to see how good God is and how much he loves you and loves people. And not only does he want to bless you, but he wants to bless people through you. And he's called you to a place. That place is, there's power in the place. It's where you find security, identity, and mastery. It's where what happens here impacts the world. It all begins with a relationship with Jesus. That's the first step. He wants to invite you into his family, the family of God. And then he wants to set you in a place to fall in love with the people 